Kentucky Book Fair. I'm glad to have see so many of you here today for this interesting program that we're going to have. The inspiration uh, came to us because of the movie 42 and the interest in the Jackie Robinson story and the fact that many Kentuckians were involved in that era of sports and the fact that desegregation actually occurred. So that's the basis of the program. Uh, First of all, I'm going to introduce um, our performer. We do have Pee Wee Reese with us today, who is a Kentucky Humanities Council Chautauqua performer. Dick Usher is from Western Kentucky and will actually make the hair stand up on your arms when you hear his pr presentation. Followed, by, uh, followed his performance, uh, Mike Embry will moderate a panel of distinguished folks who know all about this era and then we'll entertain questions from you all and hopefully somebody can answer them. So without further ado, let me tell you that it's 1985 and here's Pee Wee Reese. <laughs> Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Harold Pee Wee Reese. And for the record, I was born in 1918 on a small farm just outside a little town of Ekron, Kentucky in Meade County. In the early 1920s, my father, Carl, was fortunate, got a job with a railroad. Before long, we moved into Louisville. I've lived in Louisville, Kentucky ever since then. Always been proud to have it as my home. And Pee Wee, that's what most everybody's called me since I was 11 or 12 years old, started playing in marbles tournaments. And your smallest marble, usually a duck's, called a Pee Wee. When I played, I had a good agate Pee Wee I used as my shooter. Most boys shot with a bigger marble. I had pretty good luck that Pee Wee taught, and it got to be I joined boys in the marbles game. Somebody was always saying, uh-oh, here comes Pee Wee. <laughs> Well, somehow or another, that name stuck as my nickname. It's been that way ever since. I never thought too much about it. I finished high school, DuPont Manual, and took a job with the telephone company in Louisville. I grew up and got a lot stronger in a hurry up and down telephone poles all day long. And while I was there, I played some ball in the city church league. I played for New Covenant Church. And when I was 19 years old, nearly 20, I quit the job with the telephone company because I signed a contract to play professional baseball with the Louisville Colonels in the Old American Association League. I found out in a hurry when I started that almost all ball players had some kind of nickname, so Pee Wee fit right in. I played two seasons with the Colonels, 1938, 1939, and before the 1940 season in the winter, the Brooklyn Dodgers made some moves, got my contract, in the spring of 1940, I found myself on the way to Brooklyn to break into the major leagues. Once I started playing in the New York City area, the sports writers soon called me the Little Colonel. That name hung on through the rest of my career. And you know, a whole lot later on, World War II was over. I came out of the Navy, rejoined the Dodgers. And after a while, I was named captain of that ball club. And from that time on, most all the players would just call me the captain. Well, I am proud to be here today while my Hall of Fame experience is still fresh. Last summer, 1984, I was in Cooperstown, New York, where I was proud to be put in the Baseball Hall of Fame as shortstop and captain of the Brooklyn Dodgers in the 1940s and 50s. Shortstop's the only position I ever really wanted to play. It's a special place in baseball. It's busy. A lot of balls are hit that way. You've got to learn to get down low on a ground ball. Be quick to your left, quick to your right. Need a strong arm to make the throw from deep in the hole. And the shortstop's kind of a leader on the field because he's right in the middle of so many plays. I found out in a hurry it's important to be a leader off the field. And I was quoted later on in my career saying, if you rush in and out of the clubhouse, you rush in and out of baseball. Well, today I thought I would share a few highlights of my years as a major league ball player before the war. And I'll talk a little bit about a personal experience or two, but mainly I want to spend most of the rest of the time talking about playing with one of the great ball players of all time, a teammate became my friend Jackie Robinson, the man who broke the color barrier in modern Major League Baseball. But we'll get into that. So if you're ready, 
Well, the umpire says, it, play ball. <laughs> Take me out to the ball game. Take me out with the crowd. Buy me some peanuts and cracker jacks. I, oh, hold it. Now, my mother, Emma, didn't raise a singer. <laughs> so, won't you help me with the song? I think you know the words. By the way, the home team today, what would you think? Dodgers. Okay. <laughs> Take me out to the ball game. Take me out with the crown. Buy me some peanuts and cracker jacks. I don't care if I never get back. Let's root, root, root for the Dodgers. If they don't win, it's a shame. For it's one, two, three strikes. You're out at the old ball game. <laughs> uh, good. You ought to give yourselves a hand almost. You know? <laughs> You know, I thought you'd know the song, and I found out that that song was written way back in 1908 by a New York vaudeville performer named Jack Norworth. Now, my first season with the Dodgers, 1940, my rookie year, Mr. Norworth was invited to Ebbets Field to watch us play, and I remember they announced on the loudspeakers his first time ever to see a big league ball game. 32 years after he wrote the song, before he saw his first game. And the fans enjoyed singing in the seventh inning stretch. Well, that first season for me, my rookie year, 1940, with the Dodgers, turned out to be kind of a hard luck year for me. Early in that season, I was hit in the head by a fastball and got away from a Cubs pitcher, Jake Moody, and I was down, out, hospitalized, I wound up missing three weeks of that very first season. When I finally got back in the lineup, I hadn't played for very long till I got a hit in a ball game, slud hard into second base. That's the way Dizzy Dean used to say it's slud. <laughs> I broke bones in this foot. Well, it put me out for the rest of the year. And they sent me home to recover, hopefully for the next season. Well, the next season, 1941, I was back in the lineup, and the Brooklyn Dodgers won the National League pennant. It was a great thrill for me, playing in my very first World Series, even though we did lose to the Yankees, and our fans went kind of crazy, his first Dodger championship in more than 20 years. Well, before the 19, well, in the 1942 season, before that started, I went down to our spring training camp early to do some extra work on my fielding and throwing because 1941 I made a whole lot of errors, I thought, mainly making bad throws. I got down there, the Dodgers had signed a utility ball player named Johnny Rizzo. I talked to Johnny some, we were down there together, pretty much the only ones. I asked him to watch me out and playing in the first few exhibition games, see if he might be able to tell what was causing me a problem. He came to me a little later. He said, I notice when you go for a ball to your right, you're coming to a straight upright position to make a direct overhand throw to first base. He said, that little bit of extra time, it's taking you to stand straight up to throw. It's making you rush your throws. So I started learning to throw more sidearm, three quarters, it made a difference. I cut down on my errors from then on, became a part of my play. All through, oh, by the way, 1942, well, it turned out to be a memorable year for me in my personal life. The last week of spring trading, my Dodger roommate, teammate, Pete Reeser, and I invited our girlfriends down to Florida for a long weekend. And Second night they were there, we all went out to eat, four of us, with Dixie Walker and his wife, Stell. Now, Dixie and Stell Walker, Dixie was a Dodger. Dixie and Stell Walker had met my girlfriend, Dottie, before, so they knew her a little bit. Later on, we were sitting around talking that night, <clears throat> playing some cards, I think. Stell Walker looked up at me and she said, well, when are you and Dottie going to get married? I said, well, we can't get married now. The season's going to start in less than a week. We'll have to wait till the season's over. That'll make it October, maybe November. And she said, Harold, you and Dottie both ought to know how uncertain the future is right now with this war situation. She said, don't wait. 
Most of the young people I know are getting married as soon as they can, so they'll have some time to gather before the war splits it up. Well, I looked at Dottie, and she looked at me, and before the weekend was over, I married Dottie. <laughs> Pete married his girlfriend, Pat. My mother-in-law always did think I'd planned it that way. Well, you know, I, I'll have to say as an aside, not long ago, Dottie and I just celebrated our 43rd wedding anniversary. And along the way, we've had two great kids, Barbara and Mark. So in our case, it was good advice to marry back then. But back to 1942, the women left then to ready themselves to meet us in Brooklyn to begin the season. And Pete and I had one thing we very much needed to do was go talk to our vice president and general manager to tell him the change in the situation. Of course, that's the man with, that gives the checks and makes the arrangements, and he runs the ball club. At that time, the vice president and general manager was Mr. Larry McPhail. We didn't know Mr. McPhail too well, so we dreaded it. Mr. McPhail always came down to Daytona the last week of spring training, so he was there. He had a huge penthouse high atop a hotel in downtown Daytona Beach. The penthouse had windows all down this side, all across this wall in the back, all up this side, beautiful views of the ocean and beach. And there was a huge desk that was McPhail's workspace back here. All of his work there had a chair behind it, mahogany desk, beautiful. He had his makings for a drink and so forth. Now, we didn't know McPhail too well, but he already had a reputation by this time in baseball as being kind of a genius in putting a ball club together. He also had a reputation for being unpredictable, kind of a volatile person who drank too much. We come into the room and are sitting telling him about getting married. We don't get much reaction. McPhail is sitting back here, he pours himself a drink, he doesn't say much, it makes us nervous, we talk even more. He pours himself maybe another drink, and not saying anything, and all of a sudden he jumps up and the chair spins backwards, hits the wall, he said, hey, did you hear that? We didn't know what the heck is going, he runs around, oh, oh, there it goes, the National League pennant just flew right out this window. <laughs> yeah, he was convinced that since we'd gotten married a week before the season started, we'd thrown away any chance for the pennant in 1942. <laughs> you know, as it turned out, the Brooklyn Dodgers did not win the pennant in 1942. <laughs> but we had a very good season, and it wasn't because of any of that. We, we uh, really wound up winning 104 ball games. Usually anywhere around 100 is going to put you close, if not in the series. But you know, the St. Louis Cardinals that year were pretty amazing and won 106 games. It's still a National League record. <clears throat> they beat the Yankees in the series too, so you just have to say it was their year. 1942, all through that 42 season, the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, President Roosevelt's declaration of war that happened before the season started, it stayed in the back of my mind. And I'm sure in the back of the mind of most all the major league ball players. At the end of that season, I wound up <coughs> joining the United States Navy, sort of one jump ahead of the draft. I went into the Navy in basic training and then was stationed for almost a year in Norfolk. And during that time, you know, President Roosevelt thought that it would be good for troop morale if things were as normal as possible. And he wanted all the major leaguers, or many of the major leaguers who had been drafted, to form a couple of teams to play on the various bases to boost morale. I was fortunate to be on one of those teams. Played a lot of baseball, especially that first year. I think it was a good idea. And by the time I was shipped out into the Pacific, our first child, little Barbara, was only a few weeks old. In the Pacific, I played a few ball games in Hawaii and Guam. Beyond that, I became a part of a massive mobilization of troops for a possible invasion of Japan. Unfortunately, that invasion never took place, and I was discharged 
1945, late. And I was happy to be back home with Dottie and our little girl, Barbara, and I was ready to rejoin the Dodgers for the 46th season. Now, 1946, things were getting back to normal. Dodgers had a good year, went into the last game of the season. If we had won it, we would have tied and had to have playoff, but we did lose. Now, this is the time I want to stop and share with you the next nine seasons for the Brooklyn Dodgers, starting with 1947 and running through 1956. Nine years. In those nine years, those of you who can see this, the Brooklyn Dodgers won the pennant six different times out of the nine. The other three times we came in second. Twice there were end of the year dramatic playoffs that knocked us out. So six out of the nine seasons, you can see 1947, 1949, 1952, 53, 55, and 56. Each time we played the New York Yankees in the World Series, and each time we lost to the Yankees until we got finally to 1955. And we did win the series in 55, and it's still one of my proudest accomplishments in sports. I also want to point out to you another thing. At those nine seasons, 1947 through 1956, are the nine seasons that Jackie Robinson played for the Brooklyn Dodgers. At the end of 56, he basically retired for health reasons. So there we go. It was a Dodger decade, you might say, and Jackie had almost uh, everything to do with that. I said <clears throat> that I would say a lot about playing with Jackie, and I remember that it was really still 1945. I was on board a Navy ship coming home. And a sailor came to tell me that he had heard on shortwave radio that Brooklyn had signed a Negro to play. Although I'd have to say the word that was used was not Negro. Well, like most Americans who were white in those years from our part of the country, I didn't know what a Negro athlete was like. I just assumed they weren't good enough for the big leagues. And I'd grown up hearing the talk, you know, that if you throw at them, they get scared and back down. Well, then he told me, he said, you know, what happened is that there's a new commissioner of baseball that was appointed by President Truman. This new commissioner of baseball really okayed the deal for Branch Rickey of the Brooklyn Dodgers, the general manager at that time, to sign this uh, Negro ball player Jackie Robinson to a contract. <clears throat> he okayed the deal, the new commissioner, even though the rest of the teams in the league were against it. Now, this new commissioner of baseball, of course, turns out to be none other than A.B. Happy Chandler, former governor of our state of Kentucky. And at the time he was appointed commissioner, he was serving as a United States senator. Chandler, if it hadn't been there, the deal wouldn't have occurred. Not that way, not then. <clears throat> well, the sailor started to leave. And he turned around and he said, oh, by the way, Pee Wee, this Jackie Robinson fellow, he plays shortstop. I thought, shortstop? <laughs> Damn, nine positions on the field, he's got to be a shortstop like me, he can take my job. In my bunk later on that night, I began to wonder, worry, about what other people, family, friends of mine, what they might think about me playing with a, quote, colored boy, unquote. And then finally I thought, oh, to hell with anybody who didn't like it. He deserved a chance, just like everybody else. And if he was good enough to take my job, so be it. But I wasn't going to make it easy. So it was Jackie Robinson joined the Brooklyn Dodgers for the 1947 spring training. Now, in 47, we had scheduled some early exhibition games to be played down in the Republic of Panama. We went down to Panama City to work out to get ready for those games. <clears throat> and it wasn't uh, very long. That was the first time Jackie had worked out much with the team. We began to see what he could do. It wasn't long before Dixie Walker, my old buddy in the Dodgers, and two or three other players got up a petition demanding Jackie be removed from the team. And they brought the petition around for signatures and brought it in to me. And, and I just told them right up front, 
I wouldn't sign. You know, baseball was my only livelihood. I could already see Jackie was a good ball player and help our ball club. I didn't sign it. I don't know how much difference it made. A couple of the other players later told me, Pee Wee, since you were from the South and didn't sign it, it helped me to decide, but I don't know about that. I do know we didn't hear much more about the petition for a few days till Leo DeRocher heard about it. Now, Leo DeRocher was our manager. We called him the skipper. He was known by, already by then as Leo the Lip, and you will probably know why. Leo DeRocher didn't waste any time. He called a team meeting in the middle of the night, put a sign outside saying, no reporters, no one allowed. He stood up in front of us that night, and he said something like this, you know what you can do with that petition. I don't care if a ball player has got yellow spots or striped like a zebra. I'd play an elephant if he could do the job. We didn't hear much more about it. <laughs> we went ahead and started our, broke up, went on back to regular spring training. We broke spring training camp eventually and headed back to Brooklyn to start the, series, the seasons. Excuse me. And on our way, we stopped off to play one more exhibition game in Atlanta, Georgia. And we stopped off there that day. In the morning of that game, Jackie Robinson got a letter. It was signed by the local Ku Klux Klan. It said they would shoot him if he set foot inside Ponce de Leon Park to play. Well, it was kind of unnerving. Spring training, you're sort of isolated. We weren't prepared even though we thought we were. Jackie didn't quite know how to react. There was a tension that built up. You've got a death threat here. That afternoon, we were out on the field warming up before the game was going to take place. I was throwing to a Dodger player down in front of me here. And Jackie Robinson was standing just to my left, throwing to another Dodger player. And the tension was there. The ball club was tight. In a minute, I caught the pitch, and I stopped, and I said, Damn, Jackie, get the hell away from me, will you? This guy might be a bad shot. <laughs> We looked at each other and laughed, and the rest of the ball club saw some of that. It broke the tension a little bit. We went ahead and played a ball game. Well, we headed back. Oh, by the way, that reminds me of another incident, sort of like that, that happened later on. After the season started and we had a game in Chicago, I remember we went into Chicago. There had been a death threat come in on Jackie. And so the uh, Cubs officials asked us to stay down in the clubhouse until they could guarantee security. So we were down in the clubhouse, and it's a little tense, you know, you're waiting for a word that's gonna be all right to play. We're talking, trying to make light of it, but I had an idea, finally, that I'd go see what was going on. I left, went up the runway to the dugout, looked out on the field, and I could see security people being placed all around the perimeter of <clears throat> Wrigley Field, and I knew very soon we were going to be cleared to play. Now, I had a thought, so I went back down to the clubhouse where Jackie was, and I said, don't worry, Jackie, we'll all wear a 42. They won't know who to shoot at. <laughs> <laughs> well, we finished our spring training and went on back to Brooklyn to start the season. And it wasn't too long before we had a very important regular season road trip. We came into Cincinnati, Ohio on that trip to play a day game on the weekend. Beautiful weather. The crowd was really large. There was a large group of fans from Kentucky at that game. Many fam pieces, parts of my family and friends of mine come to see us play, see me. There was a group of black fans that came from various locations all over the South just to get a glimpse of this Jackie Robinson and maybe root for the Dodgers. They all had to sit in one location way out in right center field with some of the black community from Cincinnati, but they were there and they were ready for a game. The atmosphere was electric. Booze was flowing in the stands that day. Somebody threw a black cat out on the field to stir things up. That happened repeatedly in different cities. People would throw a black cat out to rile us about Jackie's. Well, <clears throat> some of the 
White fans, of course, were screaming all kinds of racial slurs, any of them in the book at Jackie and some that weren't. Reds players picked up on it in a dugout, started yelling and screaming. And after a while, they got on me and some of the other Dodgers saying, how can you play with that? You know the words. It was ugly. And I began to be afraid that there might be a race riot. So when we took the field in the bottom of the first inning, I picked up the slow roller that Jackie threw from his first base position and just walked over where he was, there near the base. I stood beside him, put my arm on his shoulder for a minute as though I had something to say to him. I don't know if I said anything or not, but I know I stood there for a minute because I wanted everybody to know this was my teammate, our guy, we're going to win with him. And you could hear a gasp that went up from that huge crowd. And then Crosley Field got a whole lot quieter. It was pretty much the same wherever we played that year, except maybe Brooklyn. Opposing fans and players would yell at Jackie, you call him coon, watermelon eater, jungle bunny, this kind of thing, trying to rile him. And that's when you saw Jackie Robinson stand up the plate, dare them to hit him with the ball. And you begin to put yourself in his shoes maybe and think about what it would be like for you to try to play ball under such conditions. In a word, Jackie was winning respect. You know, last summer when I was